If I were to describe how the average Catholic looks at the world today, I'd describe it like this. Broad and wide is the way that leads to heaven, and everybody's going that way. And narrow is the door that leads to hell, and hardly anybody's going that way. But you know what? That's just the opposite of what Jesus himself tells us the situation is. Broad and wide is the way that leads to destruction, and many are traveling that way. And narrow is the door that leads to life, and few there are who are finding it. Now, Jesus didn't say this because this is how it has to be. People who are on the Broadway don't have to stay on the Broadway, and that's where we come in. That's where our prayer, that's where our love, that's where our intercession, that's where our witness comes in. We need to really invite people to leave the path that's leading to destruction and find the person of Jesus Christ who can lead them to true life here on this earth and eternal life. Hey, welcome to another week of The Choices We Face. We have a really special guest this week. We have Bishop Michael Burns, who's uh, one of the new auxiliary bishops in Detroit. And welcome, Thank uh, you. Bishop Burns. Thank you. Good to be here. Yeah. Well, you know, a lot of people, when they, when they see a young bishop, they say, wow, that's so encouraging. You know, it's really great to see some of the, the, the guys that are being appointed bishops these days. But I wonder if you could just kind of, we could start the program today just talking about your own spiritual journey. Like, you were born, and, and then what happened? <laughs> I was baptized. Okay. Uh, so, uh, born and uh, raised in Detroit. Um, one of the, uh, at that time, one of the biggest parishes in the Archdiocese, St. Mary's of Redford Parish. Um, great, you know, probably typical Catholic upbringing. Uh, we, uh, we moved into the, the parish in when I was uh, going into first grade and the school was so full, uh, there was a waiting list. I couldn't get in until second grade. Wow, those were the days. The different times, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was a great, great upbringing, a uh, great uh, parish experience. Uh, early on, my uh, childhood hero was uh, my grandfather's cousin, who was a, a missionary of Africa, white father missionary in Ghana, West Africa, and he would come visit us every several years and he lived such an incredible adventurous life the stories he would bring were just incredible he he was a pioneer missionary he was the one that brought uh christianity mm. to this part of africa and so uh so i you know there was there was something in my head right then uh, second grade i remember i wanted to be a priest and um well you know it uh this is how the lord worked through an example of somebody exactly, who you yeah. admired and it just came into your heart and you just knew, hey, I want to do that too, yeah. Yeah, no, yeah, he, yeah, the story, again, the stories I can't go into, but they were just incredible stories, miracles of rain and whatnot, mm -hmm. uh, conversions. Uh, so it was, uh, yeah, so very exciting. And uh, so, you know, go through regular Catholic school, uh, sisters taught us. Um, I had really nice sisters, you know, everybody talks about these mean sisters. I never had one like that, so it was, um, I don't know what they're talking about, you know. And we I occasionally had a mean sister, but I didn't mind because I knew I deserved it. <laughs> I, don't, I don't feel bad at all about any, yeah, you know. The, right, yeah. yeah, the Christian brothers in high school, they, you know, those are the days they used the leather strap on the sure, hands. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, doesn't bother me, I deserved it, you know. <laughs> yeah, well, then when I, when I got to high school, I was with the uh, Bazillion Fathers, uh, Catholic Central here in Detroit. And uh, same, you know, it was uh, physical punishment wasn't uh, out, out of uh, order. And it works for boys, especially, you know, yeah. it just really works. Um, but it was in high school that, uh, you know, as a young kid, Jesus was very real and, and very close. Um, and as I got into middle school, uh, especially eighth grade, uh, and then into high school, uh, it, it, I started getting, there was confusion, you know. Um, you know, a big thing, a thing I mainly remember eighth grade was uh, uh, Jesus Christ Superstar, oh, yeah. which was just confusing presentation of Jesus. When I got into high school, it was Godspell, and uh, we started reading books like uh, Jesus in Bad Company, like he was a revolutionary, and another one was Jesus and Logotherapy. So now he's just like, so who is this guy? You know, yeah. he, he started becoming distant and confusing to me. Um, I still had that in mind about being a priest, but it it was uh, it was kind of further down the line. Um, so when I when I went to university, I went to the University of Michigan. Um, well, actually here in Ann Arbor, and I um, yeah, I was just you know getting into the college scene, um, and I, I was you know there was 
couple set of friends. Um, one of those guys, uh, you know, I, I wasn't like heavy into the drinking culture, but I, I you know, I was enough into it that uh, one of my friends called up and says, "Hey, we need a new bouncer here at Dooley's Bar," <laughs> which, you know, for people, now it was like the college bar. Yeah, it was very rowdy, and uh, you know, in surf period, they're just going, "Well, that sounds like fun." You know? <laughs> yeah. uh, but at the same time, um, in that same part uh, time, I was. Uh, a friend came up to me, I, you know, a friend that I, I used to go out to the gym with a lot. Um, and I said, hey, let's go over to the gym. He said, nah, I got something else. And he said, well, and so, okay, fine. You know, and when he turns to me, he says, I'm going to a prayer meeting. Would you like to go to a prayer meeting? And uh, he was a good enough friend, incredible yeah. enough friend. I said, well, well sure. Yeah. And uh, it was a uh, charismatic prayer meeting and uh, something I'd never, ever experienced. Um, but the people... You know, apart from everything else, look normal. You know, like normal people. Yeah. Besi they, besides this thing yeah, that was going on, stuff. really, yeah, they yeah. seemed like normal people who yeah. were doing this. Yeah, <laughs> and, they, and they talked about Jesus like they knew him. Yeah. And, and he sounded like the Jesus that I, I'd known as a, as a smaller child. And, but now they were, yeah, they, they had a relationship with Jesus that they would talk about. And uh, it intrigued me um, enough to um, could keep going to the prayer meetings. Um, I... Uh, Went through the Life in the Spirit seminar and uh, was baptized in the Spirit, and uh, my life changed. Uh, the, the, it was one of those encounters that changed the direction of my life mm -hmm. uh, in, in a very decisive way. Um, and uh, you know, I continued with these uh, young people through uh, uh, well through my college years, and after uh, college, I had been thinking at that point about medicine, um, and. I just felt the Lord calling me in a different direction. I mean, there was still the priesthood in the back of my mind, but it, was, it wasn't as compelling of, of a call at, at that time of life. In the mid-70s, there was a lot of confusion about what it meant to be a priest even. Yeah. And so, uh, yeah, so I, I, I... It's hard to see an environment there that looks supportive or yeah, something you can relate yeah. to. Or, yeah. yeah, even the religious order. I was an associate of the religious order that, that taught at my high school. And... Um, Really, really fine men, really good teachers and whatnot, but there was just something that just wasn't compelling. You know, this, I'm not going to leave everything behind for something that seemed to me comfortable. Yeah. And um, so I ended up doing uh, some campus ministry, uh, uh, at, mainly actually at Eastern Michigan University through our campus ministry out, outreach, and um, did a few other things before uh, the, uh, the call to the priesthood really came back in a strong way mm -hmm. in the late 80s. Mm -hmm. And in 1990, I started back at Sacred Heart Seminary. Well, started yeah. at Sacred Heart Seminary. Yeah. With the priesthood. And then I, I, I know that eventually you became a professor there and vice yeah. rector there. Yes. And, you know, people a lot of times don't know what a vice rector is, but that's the, that's the priest who's really in charge of the formation of yes. all the seminarians. So. Yes, yes, in our case, yeah. for sure. Yeah. So how, how, did, how did the whole seminary process go for you and, uh, you know, just the whole... Yeah, well, it was, uh, it was such an opportunity to um, engage the whole Catholic tradition in a, in a real systematic way that uh, it right from the philosophy forward, it was like, this is food and life, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, and yeah, it was, uh, I had a lot of heart knowledge and the, the, the head knowledge started filling out and, and, and express, being able to articulate what was going on in my heart that, uh, uh, yeah, it was just, it was, it was great. I mean, not every course was great. You know, some yeah, of the time yeah. it was kind of like, but... Uh, uh, the whole thing, though, the, the, whole ch the chance to get some real grounding in the exactly. Catholic philosophical and theological tradition, yeah. Right, yeah. Yeah. I know, I know one of the things that's kind of amazing, you go, you'll go look at the class pictures and... We were classmates together, Bishop I, Mike. Yes, I, yeah, I noticed that. Class of 1996, <laughs> MA in theology and MDiv, you know, and uh, here we are. Here we are. Uh, I had a beard then, too. So. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So uh, eventually you got ordained, and then they sent you to Rome, didn't they? They did, yeah. That was actually... They, 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 they sent you to Rome. Our Cardinal might have sent me yeah, to Rome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a very specific person. Um, there were some others that had instigated some of it, but... Uh, on the one hand, I was thrilled to study, uh, I was sent to study biblical theology. 
uh, which of course some of my Protestant friends would always look at me and say, is there any other kind? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's a good question. Yeah, right, really? you know, but, uh, yeah, yeah. but it was hard. I, it, it, my experience in the parish was, uh, I feel like, this is what God made me for. This was just, it was just so... Uh, being a parish priest a after parish ordination priest, was yeah, really working was for like, you. Yeah, yeah, it yeah. Was, you know, it was exhausting, it was challenging, it was engaging, it was uh, fulfilling, it was, it was just, you know, every day is different, and um, I was just really looking forward to go on. Uh, and I knew, I knew, you know, I was going to move on to a different parish. Uh, and when I got the phone call from uh, Cardinal, well, Cardinal Midas' secretary, now Bishop Monforton, my first reaction to the phone call was not very good. <laughs> I was glad it was with, you know, Father Monforton and not the Cardinal, because it would have... Anyway, um, yeah, but it was hard. It was a couple years mm -hmm. of really yeah. it, wrestling with my heart about yeah. what is this I've been... Yeah, yeah I understand. They, they, they sent me off to Rome eventually, too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah know, right. Totally, yeah. Really, yeah. Yeah. yeah, but it, it was part of God's plan, wasn't it? Exactly, yeah. yeah, yeah really. was, and, uh, and we've been able to use what God gave us there yeah, for good. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. I, I, I'm thrilled with the education I yeah. received. And, and then you got named vice rector of seminary, and, uh, and then one day we were all delighted and surprised to hear that you had been named auxiliary bishop in the Archdiocese of Detroit. Yeah, that was quite a... That was quite a shock. Yeah. Well, let's take a little break right now, and <coughs> okay. we're just going to get a little message in here. And when we come back, let's talk about, as auxiliary bishop in Detroit, what, what are the challenges that the archdiocese is facing, and what are, what are you dealing with? And we'll, we'll come back and talk about that in just a minute. I'm Dan McNally. I'm a theology major here at Franciscan University. I love studying theology. It's my passion. But, I mean, I love learning, too. You walk out of the classrooms, you want to know more, you don't want the lecture to end. So, I mean, that's a really great thing about being a part of a student body is you can continue to discuss outside. It's not just studying to, to make a grade. It's, it's learning to, you know, improve yourself. And not just through your own personal prayer or your own personal study, but through community, because that's what we're made for. Franciscan University is academically excellent and passionately Catholic. Hey, Bishop Mike, uh, th thanks for sharing your own personal journey. Oh, you know, it's just always you. inspiring to see how the Lord leads people and guides people. But now you're, you're right there with yeah. the archdiocesan leadership and uh, you're, you're facing the challenges that the archdiocese is, is facing right now. I know that just in my own classes, sometimes we have to talk about the statistics about what's happening and you know, some of the decline over the last 10 years that show up in the statistics is pretty sobering, like almost like 40 or 50 percent declines in baptisms and marriages and things like that and I know the the, the pain of closing mm -hmm. parishes mm -hmm. and merging them and closing schools and the financial pressures and how, how, how is this all impacting you and what, what what do you think the Lord's doing and what do you think we can do yeah because yeah. this isn't just true in Detroit it's true in so many dioceses yeah yeah. Uh, yeah 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 yeah, and you know, you, you mentioned the decline of, in the numbers of sacraments, and the, the, the one thing that's holding steady is funerals. You <laughs> yeah. know, that's not a bad, that's not a good visual yeah. on the graph. It just, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, and, and realistically, we've been managing decline in Detroit. I think that's, you know, from a, a, a broad uh, pastoral perspective, we've been managing decline for two, three decades. Mm -hmm. That's been the uh, primary reality. I mean, it's not the primary reality. I mean, the, the, the sacraments, the Eucharist, yeah. is still the primary yeah. reality, but the uh, pastoral reality is, is, is certainly one of decline. Which, I mean, there's, there's so many different factors, demographic, economic, and all mm -hmm. these things, but a lot of it is religious. Mm -hmm. uh, the, People are uh, being captured by the secular culture and yeah. Christ is becoming less important for them. The church's Catholic education is becoming less important for them. They're less willing to sacrifice for it. Right, yeah. right. The sacrifices don't make as much sense. Um, and, it, you know, it's, uh, it demonstrates that the kind of cultural Catholicism that, that worked for a good while and, and uh, a cultural Catholicism that actually helped people into a personal relationship with Jesus is, is not it's not working now and uh, we're, uh, we're, we're very fortunate in the Archdiocese of Detroit to have uh, a leader of uh, real uh, insight and vision uh, in, in Archbishop Vigneron. And he was rector of the seminary. He was rector of the seminary when I was ordained and uh, 
I was hoping to serve under him as vice or well as as a professor, but he he got picked off to go to Oakland for yeah. a few years. He's the one that asked me to start teaching at the seminary. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So. Well, like I say, insight and vision. Yeah. Really, no, he re and he he really understands that uh, what the church is about is evangelizing, and what evangelizing means is personal encounter with Jesus Christ, and so uh, we're. We're into a, a point right now where we're, we've got a vision for changing the culture of the archdiocese to become truly missionary, and those are the that's the language he uses. Uh, we've had a lot of help uh, along the way. It's impressive how many people from my own past that I've come back into con uh, contact with and collaborate with now in uh, leading an initiative in the archdiocese to uh, reorient us, to be instead of being inward focused, to being outward facing. And uh, so on the one hand, uh, we're still managing decline. I, I know in a couple of weeks I'll be presiding over the uh, relegation of one of our parishes to uh, common use. Uh, and I, that'll be the fifth in five years mm -hmm. that I've done. That's a hard thing to do, isn't it? It's funeral. Yeah. It's a funeral for, yeah. a, for a church. And, uh, and we always you know, say, yeah, a parish is, is, is not the, the, the building, it's the, it's the people, but the building matters. Yeah, it, it, it matters a lot to people, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah. yeah, it's really... When yeah. their parents and grandparents sacrifice to build it and support it, and uh, it's yeah. just hard. Well, in a lot of the parishes that, that I go to, I mean, the entering suburbs, they built it. Mm -hmm. Which you yeah. know, it's uh, it was that generation. So uh, so at the same time, uh, being able to uh, preach a strong word of you know how do we you know people always say how do we keep this from happening? Well, there is a way. We could try growing. You know, <laughs> yeah, let's yeah. try that. You know, that's yeah. it's it's natural for churches to grow. I mean, if, if that's the sign of life of anything, right? Yeah. And so uh, so there's there's a, actually. Uh, out of desperation does a certain kind of openness does arrive uh, arise and I, I think we're starting to see more than just you know a, a couple of parishes people are starting to understand that we've got to change the way we do things yeah and uh, so that's very hopeful yeah that's really good I, uh, just because I, I teach at the seminary myself now I, I've been somewhat familiar with you know, over the last several years, a whole lot of different initiatives that, that, mm -hmm. that the Archdiocese is undertaking to try to get people on board with the whole vision of evangelization. And I know that one of the major things is kind of things leading up to actually a synod. Right. Uh, maybe tell us, tell people a little bit about what, what a Archdiocese, Archdiocese and Synod is and what you're hoping from it. Right, an Archdiocese and Synod is an opportunity for the whole Archdiocese to engage in a conversation about important pastoral matters. And for us, the most important pastoral matter that ahead of us is how do we become uh, truly missionary, joyful missionary disciples. Uh, and uh, a synod is a, is a chance to, uh, on the one hand, uh, to, to offer some spiritual and uh, catechetical formation for the whole diocese uh, around a certain topic. Uh, we're planning a series of 20 to 30 three-night missions uh, focused on encounter encountering personal encounter with Jesus Christ there'll be Eucharistic adoration strong worship uh, music uh, hopefully compelling preaching and uh, as a way of uh, bringing people into uh, that kind of personal encounter with Christ that changes their heart yeah and that's sort of that's sort of like a necessity we, people right. people aren't going to be interested in being missionary disciples unless they meet the Lord themselves and exactly. something. I mean, just, yeah. you can teach them about it, you can exhort them to it, you can, you can get them to use the correct language, but it's going to remain somewhat on a theoretical right. level unless yeah. something ignites in their heart where they say, wow, taste and see the Lord. He is yeah, good. I, I, yeah. I want other people to, to taste what I'm tasting. So that's, that strikes me as really, a, really a very sound way of proceeding. Thank you, because, tr yeah. Tr trying to get more and more people to know the exactly. Lord out of which can come the desire to share him with others. Yeah. Right, right. So, uh, so that, that, that's, you know, we're, uh, we're taking risks in, yeah. in, in this and uh, which we, we experience being uh, as, a, as a leadership team comprised of myself, the Archbishop, and a, a set of mostly lay people. 
And we, we have a pretty strong consciousness of being led by the Spirit mm -hmm. in all yep. this. Um, that, that's really encouraging, isn't it, that we, he hasn't left us orphans. Exactly. Yeah. He hasn't left the archdiocese alone, <laughs> but that he's, yeah. he's willing to help people who turn to him for guidance about what to do right now. Yeah. That, that's wonderful. No, it, it is, it is, uh, it is, it's exciting. Uh, it's a little scary. Yeah. Because uh, you're not quite sure, yeah. are we keeping up or are we, yeah. you know, and, uh, but uh, every once in a while the Lord's been lifting the veil for us a little bit to see, uh, we had an opportunity to celebrate the Vigil of Pentecost and um, we packed the cathedral. We never packed the cathedral. Um, and it was such a, a palpable experience of the presence of the Holy Spirit in the liturgy that uh, a number of people were baptized in the Spirit and didn't know what happened to them. Isn't that something? Right like, at the Vigil like, of Pentecost. Like something really so happened to them. Presence. The Holy Spirit really came to yeah. them. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I. Uh, so I felt like it was, it was for us, it was, it was a great shot in the arm of the Lord saying, listen, you know, don't worry, uh, I got your back. Yeah. Uh, or he said, you know, so I... Uh, well, I've also, I wasn't able to be there, but I did hear lots of people talking about it, which you never hear them talking about it, you know? And they were saying that the archbishop seemed particularly like inspired, like the Holy Spirit was coming on the archbishop and he was preaching with a fervor that many people had never experienced before. So. Mm -hmm. That's kind of encouraging. It's very encouraging, and it's that that wasn't the first time he's you know he he's uh, you know, I say he's preaching with apostolic authority, mm -hmm. and there's something that's really uh, evident. I think I heard he also preached that way at the Chrism Mass. Yes. Yeah. yeah, it yeah. Was, that it was perhaps even more powerful. Yeah. Directed to the priests. And, yeah. Uh, so. Yeah, I've heard I've heard priests kind of they say that people the priest broke out in applause, which yeah. they had they yeah. don't normally do. No. <laughs> yeah, no, that's right. Really. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's a sign, isn't it? It is. That's it a is. sign it is a that not only is the spirit working, sign. but there's some receptivity there yeah. in, the, in the priesthood to recognizing right. the voice of the apostles, the, the power of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. 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 So, we've got a great, a great week upcoming. Our, our, our priest convocation every, every other year, uh, we've got uh, Peter Herbeck and Sister Anne. Coming Marino to, ministries, to yeah, speak yeah. to our priests, and yeah. uh, we've got a lot of uh, been praying for that a lot, and we've got a really good hope for yeah. what will come out of that. Yeah, so. yeah. No, it's uh, it's challenging times, it's interesting it really times, is. but it's also exciting times because where sin abounds, grace abounds still exactly. more, and yeah. we're we're counting on that. We're also seeing, like you see, encouraging glimpses of it, and little signs of it. Yeah. And, you know, so that's that's really good. Well, you know. Uh, I've written a booklet called Forever Grateful for Mercy because ah. mercy is so much uh, a yeah. theme right now in the church. I mean, Pope Francis said we need to lead with mercy. We need to yeah. lead with the overwhelming love and goodness of God. But we also need to understand that there needs to be a response to mercy. Mm -hmm. That mercy isn't just, oh, ho, hum, God's merciful. <laughs> but mercy calls forth faith. Mercy calls forth repentance. So we'd like to tell people how they can get this booklet. Sure. And then when we come back, Bishop Mike, I'm wondering if you would have maybe some, some closing words that you could just tell people to encourage people, people who aren't in charge of anything, you know, people <laughs> okay. who can't influence anything in their parish or diocese, yeah. just what they could do right now, Great. knowing that they're living in decline, but not in positions of responsibility. Sure. There's a lot of talk about mercy these days, but not a lot of understanding about what it actually is. And besides, there's a huge deception, which presumes that God is so merciful that hardly anyone will be lost. In this booklet, I explain what scripture and the church actually teach about mercy and what kind of response is necessary for it to be effective in our lives. I also explain what Jesus told St. Faustina about divine mercy and the tragic consequences of not responding to it wholeheartedly. This booklet will greatly help you live with confidence in turbulent times and will help anyone you share it with to open their hearts to receive mercy while there is still time. Order your free copy today by going to RenewalMinistries.net or by calling 1-800-282-4789. Well, Bishop Mike, you know, uh, th there's just so many wonderful things the Lord is doing in the midst of tremendous challenges. And I'm wondering if you could just, you'd have a word just to speak from your heart about to the average Catholic who isn't on any diocesan committees or not even on any parish committees, but is concerned about 
what, what they see happening in their parish, what they see happening in their diocese? Yeah, the, uh, the best thing you can do initially is uh, pray for the priest. Uh, the, the, what, um, what God is doing in the priest is uh, so important for the life of a parish. And so many priests uh, really experience a kind of isolation and uh, not, not despair, but just a, a sense of uh, be feeling overwhelmed with uh, the responsibility. And uh, so prayer and encouragement of your priest is uh, essential because so much of the renewal of a parish, while it needs to be driven by the lay faithful, uh, it, it, it goes through the priest. And uh, for a priest to experience uh, encouragement, <laughs> um, positive feedback uh, in, you know, in the midst of you know, some of the other feedback, uh, it, uh, it just goes a long way to, to encourage him and to, to give him the kind of energy and confidence that uh, he can collaborate effectively with the lay faithful. So uh, that would be my most mm -hmm. yeah. important advice. Yeah. And also, there's, there's nothing to stop a lay person from helping other people encounter Christ. Ex exactly. They don't, yeah. they don't have yeah. to wait for the whole parish to be renewed or the whole diocese mm -hmm. to be renewed. Right. They don't have to wait until there's scintillating sermons. You know, yeah. They can just share with, with whoever they meet. Like, exactly. like Pope Francis yeah. says, the informal preaching that happens in conversations and yeah. He even says you can even pray with people at the end of these conversations and bring Jesus into the conversation. So anyway, I'd actually like to ask all our viewers to pray for the Archdiocese of Detroit. I know this is special pleading because it's the Archdiocese where I teach in the seminary and where Bishop Mike is from. But if one Archdiocese can really experience a significant turnaround like is going on right now in Detroit, special things are happening in the seminary, special things are happening uh, amongst the bishops. Th special things are happening amongst many people. So I'd like to ask you to commit yourself to pray for the Holy Spirit to continue to work powerfully in the Archdiocese of Detroit. Uh, continue to pray for Bishop Mike and for Archbishop Vigneron and for the seminary and just that the whole, the whole Archdiocese may more and more open to the power of the Holy Spirit and experience renewal because if it happens in Detroit, it can happen anywhere, right? Amen. 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 Thanks so much, Bishop Mike, for oh, being yeah. with us today. Really right. appreciate it and really appreciate your life and your work and your ministry. Thanks very much. Yeah. Until next week. This is Ralph Martin wishing you the very best, a life of openness to the Holy Spirit. And just do whatever he tells you.